I think we are ready to get started on our second session, um, Disinformation and Public Administration. Uh, and to um, begin this session, we have our next whistleblower case study. Um, so Robert McLean, I want to welcome you to that role and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, I'll keep it pretty brief. Uh, I, um, I've been blowing the whistle on a lot of uh, presidential administrations. And uh, I always like to start these things by saying that I should not have the honor of being labeled a whistleblower. Whistle, true whistleblowers are people that uh, they come work for a corporation, they become a clerk, an auditor for a, uh, for a government agency. I was a law enforcement officer with, uh, with battle experience. And I was, my government paid me to get punched in the face. I was shot at, I fell off of a cliff. I was paid three times more than your, than your average federal employee. I was uh, electrocuted, I was gassed, uh, uh, beat, you name it. That was my job to be rough and to be fearless. So if I see law not being enforced, my job is to make sure the law is enforced. And as a public safety officer, my job is to make sure the, the public is safe. So I took a sworn oath. Whistle, true whistleblowers, they don't take such oaths. They're not trained for that. They're not trained to go through the years of, uh, of making their life miserable. So my hat goes off to, to everybody who, who does that because re you really don't have that obligation. You do it because you can't sleep at night and uh, you feel that you're letting down your stockholders or you're letting down the, uh, the public that you're supposed to be serving. Uh, I started, I sent my mother took me and essentially got out of a fascist country, Spain, under Francisco Franco. She didn't like it there. She wanted to live in the United States when we had, when we could have lived there. So I lived, I lived through learning about all of her stories. I remember water, and of course, Watergate happened after she left Spain. I remember Iran-Contra. I remember the uh, the narco wars in night in the 1980s because my father, who was an army soldier and officer, was often uh, not home when I was in high school because he was in South America fighting the narco wars. And uh, if anybody doesn't know the story, please look it up of the DEA agent that was kidnapped, tortured, and killed. Uh, uh, Enrique Kiki Camarena. Uh, last week was the anniversary of his kidnapping. And uh, it took 30 years for the supervisory agent in charge of his investigation to come out and, and whistleblow on, on how the government, the U.S. government, uh, covered up a lot of what happened there. The movie is, uh, the documentary is on Prime. It's called The Last Narc. This gentleman retired from the DEA with, uh, with the highest honors. And he said he had to wait 30 years because the United States government threatened to extradite him because the Mexican federal government had a, had a warrant on him. And the warrant expired after 30 years, and that's why he's come forward in this documentary. Uh, after growing up in a military family overseas, I became a, uh, I joined the Air Force, where I repaired security systems for remote nuclear weapons, uh, Minuteman missiles. And uh, my job was to maintain numerous redundant uh, security technologies so that nobody can gain access to these. So I know a lot about, uh, about security and that's how it dovetails into my time doing airport security and in-flight security. 
after I left the Air, Air Force, I became a Border Patrol agent where I really saw, I was really exposed to how the country just really doesn't care about immigration enforcement, about the exploitation of immigrants, and the pretty much drug smuggling with impunity. So after six years, the 9-11 attacks happen, and I go, wow, this is, this is a one-dimensional thing. Uh, the Federal Aviation Administration offered me a position as a civil aviation security uh, agent, and our primary job was to make sure that uh, bad actors and weapons don't get on aircraft, right? Makes sense. And uh, several months after, uh, there was a law passed and uh, somebody came up to me and says, you're now a federal air marshal and your job is to sit in that seat and make sure another 9-11 another doesn't happen. So we were all sitting around going, okay, we're sitting in these seats. The pilot has to get out to sleep on cross ocean flights. There's always three pilots because one needs to, uh, one needs to sleep. They have to come out and do checks to see if maybe a flap hasn't come out. So they're coming out. They come out to get food trays. They, they have to use a restroom. There are no restrooms inside of the cockpit, contrary to popular belief. And we told our supervisors, we can't work a flight attendant. We can't even help a flight attendant standing. We don't even know when that door is open. Um, most of the time, there's no way the flight attendant is going to be able to protect that cockpit. And they always said, well, they're going to eventually start installing a, a secondary barrier system that would 100% uh, effectively stop any breach of the cockpit. So after a, almost a year and a half after 9-11, that never happened, but they spent a lot of money on... Uh, making the entire cockpit bulletproof in four months. And then the, the pilots union, they protested. They said, we need secondary barriers. That door opens all the time. It, you can make it bulletproof. You can make it 20 inches thick. The door opens all the time and it's an entry. So four months after that, uh, I received this unprecedented Al Qaeda hijacking briefing where they were going to just simply wait for the doors to open, unlock. And we always said, all of us air marshals, we can't stop that. It's impossible. We can't react that so fast to stop such an attack. And so I went to the inspector general. This I went to three different Department of Homeland Security inspector general's offices. All of them told me to pound sand. So I went to uh, NBC News. The, uh, they said that they were in direct contact with the congressional uh, chairman uh, uh, people and said, okay, this is going to come out. The story came out and it was enormous. It was all over. It was on CNN. It was getting looped all day. And uh, they it, it eventually, because I had set up a, a, a union to, to, to finally go to Congress and have a collective voice, they came to me and I said, yeah, that was me who made the disclosure. Uh, long story short, the case went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled in my favor. I was reinstated and I commenced to make more whistleblower disclosures, much worse than, than, uh, than what I did in 2003. Uh, one of those was uh, something interesting is the potential, I was one of the first uh, counterterrorism officers who said, there's a potential that fentanyl, because there's so much of it coming into the country, it's highly profitable, it's uh, very low qu quantities, uh, can, be, can be transported, uh, this stuff can be weaponized. And I wrote a white paper that now a bad actor doesn't necessarily have to breach an unlocked cockpit they can just aerosolize a synthetic opioid such as a carfentanil or fentanyl and incapacitate the, the, the pilots. 
and this is all over the news, in 2003, the Russian army, they, are, they weaponized a fentanyl analog called carfentanil, and they, they used it inside of a Moscow theater, and they, and they killed over 220 people with, with uh, that synthetic opioid. So that's one of my disclosures. Um, another, and, and along with the unlocked cockpits always, always happening, is uh, is there is a unwritten rule where when law enforcement officers are ordered to conduct surprise random inspections on food catering trucks that enter into the airport secured areas, we're not allowed to look in those because they don't want they don't want any hampering of those operations. Pretty much their excuses made no sense. Hey, I understand, and people don't know, most vehicles that go into the airport are not, they're not, they're not searched. There's no magic machine that makes sure all of these, these uh, vehicles going in don't have weapons or anything else. This was a random inspection. I was told, stand down or lose your job. And that's what happened. I reported it. I detailed the, uh, everything what happened, the, 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 the local police officers told me to stand down right in front of the, the catering truck uh, driver. So now he knows that federal agents with top secret clearances can't even can't even look into the back of his vehicle on a random inspection. So I heard earlier that Fox News was uh, was singled out as but well during the Trump administration, my disclosure came out on Fox News. Specifically, it was the Tucker Carlson producers, and they got that out there. They didn't care that this would make the Trump administration look bad, and uh, they came out. So there are um, sometimes uh, we're not happy with what uh, certain media figures put out or don't put out or networks, but I've seen I've seen plenty. The New York Times and Washington Post have done beautiful stories about my case um it and so has fox news and some haven't and uh, to kind of end this one of probably the most critical news networks on my disclosures going back to 2003 was cnn and there was this reporter there that just he just constantly did these lopsided stories against me he ended up working for the tsa after leaving cnn so I'd love to, I can go on and on and on. We're talking 18 years I've been at this. And uh, they've done everything to me from uh, lock me out and make me get a psychological uh, examination all the way to referring me for criminal prosecution. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, first of all, thank you again also for your work as a whistleblower, but also for laying out this case, which I think really hits upon a number of different um, elements of sort of a topic of disinformation, public administration, running of government, um, how we design our systems, um, what inputs we don't want into it, and even sort of revolving door at the tail end. Um, so it really hits a lot. Um, before we dive into uh, some of the major topics um, that we have sort of on on the table for this session, I just want to see if any of you had any particular initial um, comments on Robert's um, remarks. I was just going to ask if there was a particular uh, moment where you or where at least you, you felt uh, attacked uh, in the sense that there was false information going on around you that, uh, that, uh, that would sort of attack you on a personal level, let's say uh, slander. Or, and, and how did that make you feel as the months would go by? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Going back, speaking of disinformation, the public spokesman of the Air Marshal Service would come out and talk about one of my disclosures is that everybody on the plane knew who the Air Marshals are, if you were looking. I mean, if you're a bad actor who wants to find out who an Air Marshal is and take away their weapon, which is now being made fun of in, in, uh, on 
on in movies or one particularly is called a blood red sky where they just simply act had an unruly passenger act up the air marshals came out so they knew exactly who to disarm and the the spokesman said oh nothing to see here folks uh the passengers are not looking to see who the air marshals are so don't worry about that no you know they're, they're busy reading their magazines or 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 playing a game and that's not what we said we said the people that want to kill us and die those are the people making that are that want to so here's something that's real recent we know about the 737 max disaster after when the first crash happened they demonized the pilot saying well they're foreign and so they must have poor training and also they work for a foreign budget airline so they started demonizing the pilots when in fact we know there's this tarum report t a r a m the the fa right after the crash knew exactly what the problem was as they were allowing these pundits to come out and demonize the pilots and their airlines saying it was their fault this is nothing like this could happen to Boeing. and so the faa was like well it, it in that report it said the 737 max will crash every two years that's going on right now with secondary barriers i have all of the i have ac access the reports that haven't been published to the public that don't know that not only secondary barriers are totally effective, the FAA knows that eventually there's gonna be another disaster, but they're letting it wait out because they're hoping that the public just forgets about it. And so right now, they're, the, there's, they finally passed a law mandating these secondary barriers four years ago, and they're still not installing them. So we're going back to, they're just, they're not going to do anything until there's another disaster. Just like they did on the first 737 MAX disaster, they knew that thing would crash every two years. It, another one crashed after the Tarim report within months. So yeah, it's, uh, we know there's, I mean, it's, it's right now open with the 737 MAX reports. And, and if you look into it, they're still redacting, not only they're redacting public documents, they're still not providing documents, the FAA, to the congressional oversight committees. Think about that. That makes no sense. Our country is supposed to have three um, branches of government, and the con Congress, who represents the people, is not allowed to know anything about an aircraft. This is not classified information. This is not, a, this is not some kind of a weapon. This is not some type of CIA accent. This is a passenger aircraft that they're withholding documents from Congress. Robert, that's a really great connection into the kind of the first major topic um, I wanted to sort of have us talk a little bit about in terms of um, disinformation and public administration, which is really, you hit both of it, sort of lack of transparency, um, and sometimes abuse of classification process. And then when you do put something out, how it's redacted. Um, and you actually just sort of walked right in and provided a couple of really um, nice examples of that, um, you know, as really ways in which, um, you know, the government is sort of hindering the ability, um, you know, through controlling information to understand what's going on and to evaluate government decisions. Um, and uh, so I just I thought I'd open up. I know someone had popped um, their uh, Mike on, but to see if anyone sort of wanted to kind of carry on further with that sort of the issues of transparency, classification of documents and um, redactions. Oh, real quick, my whole Supreme Court case that I won, they classified with this pseudo secrecy marking that a door that opens throughout the flight, may, that disclosure was enough to fire me. This is something everybody sees on the plane. They designated that as this unclassified sensitive security information marking, which finally two appellate courts, including the US Supreme Court said, that makes no sense. So wanna make that clear. That's how they fired me by, by this pseudo secrecy marking 
that a clerk at TSA, even a flight attendant, can issue. Thank you. Uh, Samantha, and then I saw Mary McGuire. Sure. I just wanted to um, say, you know, first of all, Robert, thank you so much, um, first of all, for your, your bravery and your courage and for blowing the whistle and really for saving us all um, on many counts. And you know, whistleblowers often don't get the gratitude that they deserve. Um, in fact, what they get is the polar opposite of what they deserve. And that's absolutely you know, what happened to you. And you know, I think it's interesting to see how you know, even after you blow the whistle, even after you go all the way up to the Supreme Court, even after you win your case, you don't see behavior change. And if you blow the whistle again, you, they'll just retaliate again, whatever consequences there are in these cases when a whistleblower wins, it's not enough. It is not enough to produce meaningful deterrence. And I think that is a systemic issue we need to grapple with. The lack of transparency is a serious issue that we see all the time. And I think that it's really interesting what happened in Robert's case, the way that that can be weaponized. And these criminal and civil slap suits are the most common tactic that we're seeing, not just in the United States, but around the world. And the fact that we don't have legal protection for whistleblowers from retaliatory um, slap suits. And it's the same thing, actually, you know, journalists, um, as you know, are experiencing um, the same thing, these slap suits. And it really is silencing the truth from getting out there. And it's a big weakness in our system that can be fixed through legislation, there are solutions that are there. Um, and I think that that's something that we really need to, to work towards and take seriously. If there's, there's studies that show that the majority of voters, both conservative and liberal, um, support whistleblower protection. Um, and so it, it really is a bipartisan issue. It's something that the public wants, but we're not seeing that from from politicians. And I think that you just want to commend President Biden for hiring Dr. Brick, Brick Bright and you know, actually hiring a whistleblower. You don't want to lose the talent that they offer. And when you sideline them, you're losing the benefit of their service. Um, and so in hiring Dr. Rick Bright, I think it's, it's a really strong public symbol. I think that the government can start making things right by hiring back more whistleblowers and showing that they will be thanked and rewarded for getting the truth um, out there instead of proceeding to um, you know, silence the messenger, silence the truth, redact, redact, you know, Freedom of Act, Information Act requests. Sometimes I get answers back two years later. You know, you have to file a lawsuit to get anything done, which takes a tremendous amount of resources. So there's a lot that's really broken that can be fixed um, and really should be. Mary McGuire. Hello, yes, I wanted to say two things. One is that um, the, the issue of redacted documents and the difficulty with getting kind of accurate information, even where there are uh, freedom of information laws that uh, supposedly allow you to, to kind of withdraw this information. Sometimes the redacted documents make absolutely no sense grammatically uh, because there is so much redacted that you pretty much just have a couple of conjunctions in pages of these documents. Um, so that, that's kind of one problem with the um, kind of access to information. But I wanted to kind of go back to what Robert was talking about, the full weight of civil and criminal procedures being brought against um, uh, whistleblowers and against journalists who, uh, who seek to publish. And we had uh, a situation in, in Ireland a few years ago, well, in the UK, really, where uh, two journalists who had made a film uncovering uh, police collusion in uh, paramilitary killing, you know, kind of 20 years ago, um, spent a year on bail um, for kind of breach of official secrets, um, security threats, uh, theft. They were actually accused of theft at one point um, because of documents that they allegedly stole from the Northern Ireland Ombudsman's office. Um, but the government was a bit embarrassed really and had to withdraw the theft one when um, the Northern Ireland Ombudsman said they had not reported any theft. <laughs> so, um, but, but, you know, a year before, uh, you know, a High Court judge ruled in their favour and said that the warrant um, for seizing all their documents, um, kind of invading their homes, arresting them was disproportionate use of power. 
Um, so I think it's it's the kind of sheer weight. And I think Robert spoke about, you know, the psychological assessments as well. You know, you probably begin to question your own sanity uh, when you're going through a, a year of, of this. So thank you. I want to pick up on something, Mary, that you said about redaction. Um, I was familiar with the US, so typically what you see in the US style of redaction, which is the document is there and just uh, the key words, passages or pages are just blacked out. Um, but I was introduced to a version of UK redaction um, where the, the all you have is asterisk is to sort of capture what's not going to be shared. So you don't know how many pages was that was that asterisk ex, you know, part that was excerpted and you are not seeing, was that one word, one paragraph, one page, five pages, you have no idea. So there is at least a sense when it's the documents are just blacked out. Wow, I'm looking at a 90 page, a 300 page report and 90% of it's not visible. At least I sort of have a sense of what I'm missing too. Um, so I thought that was just another level um, that I was not even aware of um, in terms of that. Uh, one thing I just thought I'd mention, uh, you know, it was um, it, it really was picked up by by some of the comments uh, in the U.S. context. One of our sort of um, sort of great examples of sort of both the secrecy and finally some level of revelation um, concerned the CIA torture report. Um, and one of the points that Senator Dianne Feinstein made um, sort of when she was um, uh, putting forth the, the Senate's um, well, the Select Committee on Intelligence, their sort of study of this, um, she talked about one of the problems with this level of secrecy was even the agency did not learn from its own mistakes. So even within its own goals, its own parameters, sort of the, the lessons of the past in terms of what doesn't even work, forget morality, what doesn't even work, uh, seems to have just been lost as well. And there was sort of no one there, uh, no one sort of around, no one on the outside to sort of sort of remind them of their own lesson. And so just still another layer uh, that's lost in terms of sort of um, good governance. Um, I thought now I turn to sort of another aspect of thinking about disinformation and, and sort of public administration, which is something we might broadly put under the heading of conflicts, whether we're thinking about revolving doors, something Robert, you had mentioned, uh, unethical lobbying, um, undue influence, uh, you know, it's a, or even a version of lack of transparency. This one is very familiar to me as a tax lawyer, uh, burying special rules deep within an already complicated regulatory um, regime. Um, and so that's sort of a way in which sort of it's, it's either, you know, sort of no information uh, in, or in a version of sort of disinformation about what's really going on. So I thought I'd sort of open up any conversation you all might might want to have on that examples or concerns that you've had. Yeah, I'll jump in here. This is so much happening in our region where uh, there is a backdoor between businessmen and politicians, uh, governments and businessmen working together to manipulate uh, and uh, block information or even put journalists in trouble in a way away from their um, right to freedom, opinion and expression and get them into trouble in a different ways. We have several examples from this, even you know, forging uh, cases against them because they know that they are supporting either fact checkers or whistleblowers or journalists uh, and investigative journalists. I think this is widely used, have been for many, many years. Uh, but the tactics, um, I'm also aware that some lawyers are really helping them in this to fabricate the whole case against this, uh, this person, getting him into trouble, uh, even you know, with fake witnesses, um, just as a retaliation of the work they are doing. If I can jump in with... Uh with an interesting example from the Eastern European region, uh, a very pertinent example, which is of uh, Bulgaria's law on reg regulating offshore wealth and uh, owning offshore assets in general. And it's interesting to note that the party and the people within that party that proposed and ultimately helped uh, 
for the act to be adopted are the same people that it benefits in the sense that the act has been written, has been adopted in such a way that it's, it's, it's basically toothless. It looks good on the face of it, but it doesn't actually work because of all sorts of uh, details that have been included or purposefully uh, excluded. And it's also interesting to say that those very same people are uh, up until recently uh, influential people with lots of money and owners of media. And any time uh, uh, information from the outside, let's say the Pandora Papers comes up and, uh, and it turns out that yet again, there is a lot of uh, illegal uh, movement of offshore wealth uh, and, 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 and escaping of taxes, uh, those same media that they own, they of course crank up the, the, this information, they, they, they question the sources, they question the Pandora Papers, or they, or they try to shift the blame to uh, someone else. So, so there's this uh, cyclical effect where, um, yeah, you, you, you use media to uh, influence policymaking and lawmaking, and then you use those laws to, uh, uh, to assist yourself in gaining even more leverage and influence over the media landscape, because those bad laws are what allow you to, uh, to make illicit financial dealings, which is then what allows you to keep buying out media. And you can buy out media because you can uh, perhaps bribe or in other form pressure uh, some of the people associated with that media or the owners of the media, et cetera, et cetera. So it's this uh, continuous uh, cycle here again, a malign cycle of sort of degradation, really. Thank you. Robert. Yeah, real quick, another, pr I, I blew the whistle on the first passenger surveillance program in 2004. It was uh, a $21 million software and a device that was issued to air marshals. And they were told, air marshals were just not doing it. And finally, they put out a blanket order that if you don't do not submit at least one intelligence report on a passenger, we're going to discipline you. So they were just saying, even if you see, and one of the emails actually said this, even if you don't see anything, make something happen. And so this company that the Federal Air Marshal Service Director gave the $21 million contract to, after my whistleblowing had him forced out of his position by the US Congress's House Judiciary Committee, he went to go work for that, com that company. I mean, just, it was obvious. All the whistleblower organizations caught this and uh, the government, the inspector generals, Congress didn't do anything. So I thought I would raise another issue um, that we see in the context of sort of efforts to uh, have governments function and run um, and how, uh, information can be weaponized um, by effectively sort of outsiders against a sort of democratic government, against government operations. So for example, it might be foreign countries, it might be terrorist organizations, it could be uh, criminal organizations. Uh, and you know that the effort to, whether it's so distrust, so the government really can't quite function, uh, maybe to take some existing narratives and, and sort of blow them up. Um, but effect effectively just to undermine, uh, you know, sort of public support for public trust in um, government institutions. And um, so I, you know, wanted to sort of raise that and sort of see if you all had some thoughts. I know there, the New York Times had done, I mean, actually, I think the Wall Street Journal, um, a look at Russia's interference in the US elections 2016, 2020, and a comparison and an evolution in techniques over time. So there was an effort there effectively trying to uh, undermine or impact the election process in another country. So the heart of sort of democratic governance um, and, you know, sort of 2016, looking at sort of certain kinds of hacks and use of social media, buying ads, but by 2020, uh, becoming much more sophisticated, harder to detect, 
Um, hiring real people, so you're having better language skills, sounds like a real um, sort of, you know, as someone you would expect in the US to be writing something. Um, and so really just sort of the, the proliferation of both those efforts and the, the skill with which they're um, able to be executed. So thought I'd open that up for any thoughts you may have. Samantha. Sure, I'll, I'll open things up. It, there's a lot to unpack. And I think a lot of it touches on things that we've already talked about a little bit. Mary was talking about Cambridge Analytica, which we know is backed by populist Steve Bannon, right? And they use Facebook and they, you know, use basically um, a psychological profiling to be able to, uh, you know, manipulate and control. And on the Facebook whistleblower and the way that Facebook um, was was knowing, you know, the effects and manipulations it was having on it, uh, on people. And, you know, on the other side, we talked, Roberts talked a bit about, um, you know, how people need to have some ownership over checking credible sources. Um, but one thing I think we do really need to talk about is confirmation bias. Because, you know, when you start to have this confirmation bias, it's in all of us. There, there, there's no like one person or one party that's susceptible to this. I don't know how many people who are participating today can honestly say they seek out the opposite view on any given issue that they're following. How many of us are really checking conservative or liberal on a regular basis? If you look at something like, you know, Intelligence Squared, um, which has, you know, facts on one side, facts on the other, it's genuine debate, and then people can kind of make a decision. You don't often have that sort of um, balance or seek out that balance on, on any given issue. So I think you see really, really intricate um, schemes that are embedded more deeply now than ever before with how Russia and China um, were using the media and companies that work with the media within companies within companies, um, which is hard to trace, uh, you know, the source, but they're using it for, you know, political destabilizing um, reasons and there's enough people who are susceptible to this confirmation you know bias and psychological manipulation who are kind of their prey and then on the other hand you know there's no like civic education that talks to you about you know how to research or fact check and um it teaches you about credible sources and it gets harder and harder we've heard today about you know credible journalists and credible news within publications that have also been responsible for, you know, spreading misinformation and, and disinformation. Um, and um, also how within really credible uh, or seem to be credible news outlets, you've had some journalists get things, you know, really wrong. And you've seen some sloppy mistakes that have put people's lives at risk. This, ha this happens everywhere. So I, I absolutely think that the media has been used, especially um, in COVID-19, um, you've seen like influencers and how influencers are being bought and you don't know what's behind the people who are paying these influencers to go out and make these statements. And then they have this huge following and then they themselves have been, um, blowing the whistle, um, on the internet, on social media, on these companies. And, you know, our laws right now for what they are, are not equipped to keep up with this kind of whistleblowing. Legally speaking, very few whistleblower laws can actually protect someone who makes a disclosure publicly to the media. Um, and it's getting better, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. That's not typically seen as whistleblowing, and it and it does need to to start to be. Um, but with the sophistication sophistication behind information and um, the way that you know companies um, are using subcontractors and subcontractors, and the way that things trickle down, um, it's getting harder and harder to keep up with. And in an emergency, you see that it's a big scale like the pandemic, it's harder and harder. And so in the case of Facebook, 
you're seeing them and, and all these other big tech companies, you're seeing start to filter all of this bad information, but they're also filtering whistleblower speech because it's public and they're hiding these, you're hiring these corrupt companies um, to do these fact checking. And so they're taking truthful speech out as much as they're taking bad speech out. Um, and it's really a system that's not um, working. So very dangerous. So yeah, that's a very, very important point because on YouTube, you have all, you know, followed up what happened recently and some of the fully fact-checked information have been, you know, removed. And we are even now thinking, you know, because all of those platforms that gave all of this content, uh, like hosting for free, uh, now if, if, those, if this fact-checked content is removed, uh, many, many platforms and media outlets in, in our region, they don't have any other place that this content is there. And it's like removing history. It's not, it's it's a very, very serious problem that some of our IJ centers and investigative journalism centers are thinking of using other platforms that are, that audiences are not there, but at least, you know, you have a backup or an archive for content that will be one day uh, regarded as, as fact-checked. And there is in Lebanon, for example, in the Middle East, they issued the Ministry of uh, Information laws. Those laws in this slogan is, is against misinformation, disinformation. In reality, it's against journalism and fact-checked content. So it's very much used in the opposite way. Actually, Ron, that I want to pick up on something you said, because I've seen themes across the different topics that we're having here in session two. Uh, we were talking just a moment ago uh, about sort of conflicts of interest, revolving doors, things like that. Um, and the, one of the connections I wanted to make to sort of um, the weaponizing of information is weaponizing against a government, but also how the revolving door or conflicts of interest uh, can uh uh, limit a country's ability to react. So thinking about, um, for example, uh, reports that the UK government failed to uh, investigate Kremlin interference um, and that sort of that the um, UK elites provided access to companies and, and uh, political figures. Uh, so they were essentially available for influence, a bit of a sort of conflict of interest. Um, and they were, and the effect of that was in fact, influence from sort of outside the country into the sort of processes of government. So you have both sort of the conflict of interest problem and the weaponizing of information. And then I just wanted to pick up on, on another theme that came here, which is you can have weaponizing sort of against the country's efforts to operate in a democratic fashion, whether it's, you know, uh, in, you know, impacting voting or other processes in your country, but also governments weaponizing information out. And, and th there are connections to what we've talked about even in the first panel, um, but I just sort of wanted to highlight sort of it goes in both directions. Um, the last uh, sort of theme I wanted to pick up in this session is, is thinking about education and science and research as part of the public interest, the role of the government, the role of the public sector. Um, and we can be thinking about that, you know, through public schools from, you know, K through 12 up to the university level. Um, and I thought I'd start off with two examples. Um, uh, one is about book banning, right? Uh, and we actually see that on the rise in different places at the community level in the US. Uh, you also see it in other countries. You see it in China, in Russia, uh, and then, a related topic of gag orders, you know, trying to restrict what is taught in school, what is discussed to keep the topic completely off limits. Um, and so that's really a place in which through education, through the schools, government um, may be uh, really trying to both provide maybe disinformation or just simply limit information. Um, and so I thought I'd open that first up for uh, perhaps comment. Um, I see Robert, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, real quick. I, I've been very disappointed with the United States university system. It doesn't, and, and I, I know all the, I know all the whistleblowers in the United States. Just about we talk, we communicate frequently. Universities don't want to hear talk to them. I go, uh, you know, we have all these ethics classes, political science, government classes. Nobody's inviting whistleblowers in to be. To, to speak to, to 
why not Harvard hire a, a whistleblower to come in and and, and talk about real life experiences. Uh, it, it's not happening and it needs to happen. So uh, this is why I am really excited about this, this event. Uh, hopefully I like maybe Boston College starts bringing in having some whistleblower speak. There used to be a whistleblower tour that I believe uh, the Government Accountability Project sponsored and it just disappeared. I don't know what happened to it. And I think it, it vanished during the Obama years. So um, there's my challenge out to uh, to the universities. Awesome. Yeah, and, and really um, thank you for bringing that up, Robert. And just to add on to that, I can imagine, I mean, I'm just gonna go out on a limb here and say that I'm imagining whistleblowers don't know for years that they're gonna be a whistleblower until it happens. And, and the reason I bring that up is because um, you know, privacy, uh, uh, digital security practices, you know, having strong passwords, not saving your emails for years and years and years, like these types of, of, um, of things that we teach in some of our projects through tactical tech and across really the whole field of online safety, online privacy, I think are, are such critical skills to also be taught. Um, because, you know, even for example, using alternative tools, using VPNs, using password managers, um, not only using Google's, you know, suite of products, but venturing out from Google search, venturing out from Google maps and, uh, you know, knowing how to take care of the settings on your phone. Like these are just some of the things that it takes a really long time for someone to wrap their head around it. And so if someone is in immediate current, you know, um, danger or immediate currently um, being targeted for whatever reason, you know, for example, as a whistleblower or for example, in other ways, um, sometimes just as being in the wrong place at the wrong time, being a, a my, someone in a minority group, um, and that's why I really think all of these practices are so important to normalize and to teach and, um, you know, uh, just to, to have more openly discussed in, in training sessions, whether it be at university or hopefully earlier, you know, middle school, high school. Um, I think it can make a really big difference when someone is in that place that they are better prepared to take care of themselves, that they know, for example, that just turning off location tracking on their phone isn't enough, that actually your phone is tracking you in multiple ways. And it's important just to know that those exist, you know, so you don't have a false sense of security. Um, so there are just so many, so many ways, but I, I need to stop myself. <laughs> Thank you. Garan? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, talk a bit more about the connection between external authoritarian actors, their attempts to gain influence. And so the connection between that and conflicts of interest, uh, corruption, uh, undue influence, whether it be on the highest levels of governments or it could be in, you know, uh, uh, city prosecution's office. Uh, absolutely, it can be, uh, small time, but, but the main point is, is that uh, the way authoritarian actors uh, try to establish and maintain influence is by exploiting uh, these conflicts of interest and corruption. Uh, that's, a, that's a key, it's a key, it's a key moment. They basically, they exploit uh, conflicts of interest to capture key institutions and that's how they gain influence. And there are many tools which they use to do this. And one of them, though, is disinformation, because disinformation is a great tool to obfuscate facts, to uh, divert blame, to, let's say, an investigation into a corruption scandal starts. You can, you can definitely put that whole thing down if you have enough information influence and if you produce the, the appropriate, uh, so to say, disinformation narratives. Um, so to put it, basically, this information in this context is used to, to, to hide uh, unethical lobbying and other forms of undue influence. And, and there's also a connection there with social perceptions as well, definitely. 
Okay, uh, Donato and then Mary before we um, yeah. try to wrap Thank up you. our session. Thank you very much. Just to come to Robert's comment, um, really, as I said before, the education school has bought an important role no, in the spread of information and, and talking about truth. Um, and I agree with Robert. Uh, the real problem is just is not just this information in non-democratic countries. We know that there is a big issue, but uh, uh, it is a big issue in those that we assume to be democratic. So academic uh, integrity uh, in this information are currently uh, in the agenda. I have seen recently a lot of conferences on this point. Um, I cannot touch too, ma too many points, but uh, uh, having a whistleblowers in conferences like this uh, is an extremely important way to share important experience and truth. So I agree with Robert that this is a moment uh, and also university can do um, uh, a part in, the, in from, from this. And the, so um, like we have said previously, uh, some institutions are hiring the whistleblowers. I think that any university should have an inclusive policy in order to ensure uh, that any whistleblower can talk about the protocols and procedures that we need to follow in the university for academic integrity, for avoid corruption, and so on. So uh, this is a, an opportunity for the future. So uh, this is just a, a point that I would like to raise, but there are many others like the impact of nepotism, relationship between the politicians and the academics, the conflicts of interest, uh, when uh, uh, there is uh, uh, the need to write a paper, uh, you are funded by certain institutions. So the, really the topic is huge. And I think uh, that there will be time to discuss uh, in other conferences. Thank you. Thank you, Donato, for raising that. Because I wanted to sort of jump in with a kind of concrete example and, and really sort of, I thought it was a nice turn um, looking at sort of um, the university uh, thinking about information um, and scientific integrity, uh, research integrity, uh, the development of an information base. Um, and just two quick examples there. Um, you know, one was uh, coming out of Florence in 2017, uh, which really exposed the corruption um, in the system of uh, uh, candidates being appointed as professor. Um, and effectively it was based on nepotism and the sort of wiretap was able to demonstrate that um, clearly uh, and, and move that to court. Um, and so it was you know, not just a subtle thought that there's some bit, but actually very much how the system operated, which then gets at the heart of who's, who has positions, why they have it, uh, whether they have the skills to do the research and just sort of whether or not um, uh, the university is what we think it is. A related point I, or example I really wanted to offer um, kind of comes at expertise from another side of the university. Um, academics are often uh, relied on as experts, either um, giving advice to governments or serving as expert witnesses uh, for judges in courts uh, and sort of thought to have some level of independence. Uh, but in really interesting, and this was in uh, uh, a virtue, uh, which is a related plat uh, research project, virtue national Re virtue research national workshop um, that focused on the Netherlands, and I think we'll put the link into the um, uh, into the chat. Uh, what came out was a discussion about the the observation that in the Netherlands most of the tax law professors were also working uh, in the big accounting firms. That was pretty much what you did. Um, not necessarily the same as you see in other countries. You don't see that, for example, in the U.S. Uh, why did that matter? Uh, it meant that the government typically was turning to the tax professors as a source of independent guidance on developing tax policy. Um, but really, were they any more independent than any other lawyer account would be given they were also working for uh, the major accounting firms? And that would similarly apply if you're thinking of them as an expert witness. So it's really, um, uh, you know, these connections can, can weaken our understanding of sort of having some place for some type of independent um, research. 
Um, we are at 1232. Um, I, so I'm gonna close our second session. Um, we had some great questions. They were really more suited to the third. So we're holding them over. Um, so we have, I think a great opportunity in the third session to pull a lot of threads together. So we will come back in five minutes at 1237 Eastern time.